Um, hello, everyone, and thank you. Uh, my name is Lee Orff. I'm a scientist at the University of Wisconsin. And today I'm going to talk to you about some high resolution supercell modeling. Um, I've been doing supercell modeling and thundercell modeling since the 90s. The computers have gotten much better, the models have gotten better, and the simulations have gotten better. And, um, but we've got lots of challenges still ahead of us. So I'm using full physics cloud models to simulate tornadoes. So they form quote unquote naturally within the simulation. So I've been doing this since, well, like I said, for a while. Um, I've always taken a harder first approach. What that means is, I, you know, once I was exposed to computers as a young person after I, tornadoes tried to kill me and stuff, which got me interested in weather, um, I thought, hey, how can I, how can I exploit computers to learn things about storms? So I've always been interested in putting the hardware at the center stage. I'm wearing my blue water as hoodie here. It's kind of cold here. University of Illinois, one of the best supercomputers ever built, right down here in the CSA. You're going to see results from that supercomputer in this talk. Um, but I've always focused on the supercomputing aspect because as much as tornadoes are exciting and weather is exciting, there's some real boring logistical stuff you have to work on to get the physics right and to get uh, the model to do something useful. Um, the primary gains I've made recently in my research have been in data compression, which sounds so boring, right? What does that have to do with tornadoes? Um, but the big data problem is here to stay. So what are the what are, what are the problems with models? I'll start with the bad side first. I'm like Jim, I think you start with good stuff. I'll start with bad stuff. Just representing clouds. And the myriad processes that go on inside of clouds that produce grapple, hail, rain, billions and trillions of droplets of all different sizes, we cannot have a hope of actually capturing that correctly. So what we do is we use mixing ratios, we simplify things, it's still very complicated, but the microphysics code is, is like without good microphysics, your cloud model is not going to be very accurate. Resolution is a huge problem. You wind engineers can run at super high resolution oftentimes because you're only simulating a chamber, but I gotta go up to 30 kilometers. There's no way you're gonna get sub sub-meter resolution on the ground isotropically when you're going 30 kilometers. And I don't want to hear about stretch vertical grids because you know you really don't get resolution when you only stretch one coordinate. You get some, but not really. So I adequately resolving things. Um, interaction with Earth's service, we're terrible at that with, with uh, meteorological models. Your surface is flat. Any questions? Um, you know, I mean, there's no core source. There's a lot of things that are simplified, but that's okay because there's still a lot of things that we can learn. Um, and of course, this group, interaction with the built environment, the natural environment, we do that terribly in cloud modeling. We really don't have trees and buildings being hit by our cloud model generated tornadoes. And that's something I hope to change in the last 10 to 15 years of my career, hopefully. Well, let me show you what we've done well. Um, this is a simulation that was made on a blue water supercomputer about eight years ago. It's a 10-year simulation showing a long-track EF5 tornado. You've seen the cycloidal pressure tracks. These are pressure deficits, so think of them as damage patterns, tree fall patterns, whatever you want. Um, that looks pretty convincing, I think. Notice all these little swirling vortices coming in to feed that tornado. One of the things that my research continually is, is suggesting is that vortex mergers are critically important. Not just during the tornado maintenance stage, but during genesis. Uh, and that's something I'm focusing on quite a bit. So this is sort of state of the art. Here's another view showing vorticity. Uh, one vortex, two vortex, one vortex swings around, merges with that vortex. A lot of complex things going on here. And I've been, you know, there's been some talks about, yeah, case study world. We have to do case study world sometimes. Modeling world's even worse, really. You've got one model. Well, you could run several iterations of that model. Solids. But when you consider a simulation like this, 10 meter simulation on the waters took like four weeks of dedicated computer time, unless you're going to build more computers, you're not going to get too many 10 meter ensembles. So they're very computation expensive simulations, so I want to squeeze as much out of them as I can. Um, so again, vortex merger, one, two. So the nice thing about a model is you've got the whole simulation in front of you, you can run backwards and forwards and do all sorts of fun things. So you're seeing, again, these are the tracks of vortices as, as revealed by the vorticity. Uh, field, uh, cyclotic vorticity, um, it's wrapped up into a big tornado. The third merger just brings it into a nice, a big, nice uh, EF5 tornado. It's, it's going to start. So I decided I want to track vortices over time. I want to basically chronicle, I want to do vortex relative analysis. So let me just pause this right here. So what I've done is I've generated a really simple vortex tracking code that starts with the vortex on the ground, follows the pressure 
the local pressure would have been that vortex, and you go up there and you just connect it together. Then I go back and I actually trace things along the vortex. So vortex relative analysis on A and four here. Um, so I've tracked the center of the vortex core. There's one merger, did you catch it? There's one merger. That's an important merger. Little things like this may matter when it comes to predicting tornadoes, and that scares the crap out of me because I don't know how we're going to do it. It's going to be probabilistic. It's all going to be probabilistic. It's all going to be probabilistic. <laughs> Chances is never going to be, you're never going to catch it all. This, right? I mean, that's just crazy. Um, Ten years, you know, again, it took six weeks or so to work to run this here. Okay, but again, not all bad. Looking from the ground up now, vortex merger, one. Another vortex merger, that's a tornado strength to the ground. I track it when it reaches the F0 strength. And what's interesting about this event is the tornado vortex, which is, is sort of like moving around the, the mesocycle. We'll see a better image of this later. Um, it's, it's, it's very interesting how the storm, I'll pause it right here. So here we're looking at the updraft. So that updraft, that mesocyclone, there it is. Here is the cold pool. This storm is actually sitting over the cool air. It's, it's a little bit in, it's not right out on the front. Um, but you can see that supercells are all about ingesting cool air okay, at the low levels. This supercell is ingesting almost all the air that makes up the tornado in the ground is to the cold pool. Um, a lot may be different, but you know, that's one thing my research keeps telling me is that you know, the, the tornado is the cold pool at the ground level, at least. It's, it's right, usually along the leading edge of it or, or embedded within it, where there's tons of vorticity available for doing all these things we just heard about, stretching and tilting. But I would add to that, vortex mergers are also super important. That's one thing I think we're missing. In our meteorological understanding of our tornado score, we often talk, again, the textbook case of convergence, some initial seed of vorticity stretching and boom, you have a tornado. I'm saying that's probably true in a general sense, but a lot of details being missed about where that vorticity is and how it's in it and how it's working. Because again, these mergers are happening all the time. Uh, again, this is just vorticity uh, showing the field over, over time. Now, where are we going with this? Oh, here's just tracking air particles. Okay, so here's this thing we call this, this streamlined vorticity current. This is before flying in the storm. Tornado has not formed yet. Look at all these vortices. What I'm doing is I'm shading the vorticity with the streamlined, com streamlined components. So you have streamlined and anti streamlined vortices, and maybe some crosswise if it's in the, in the middle. Anti streamlined vorticity is just streamlined vorticity with a rotating anti cyclonic. It's just as important. An anti cyclonic tornado will have lots of anti streamlined vortices. So mostly you see reds here, though, because this is a cyclonic right moving supercell. So here's a forward flight. Here's this thing we call the SVC. I'm dropping the parcels in the cold pool. And they all go in the same place. It's giant vacuum cleaner in the sky. It's just doing tremendous amounts of work. I'm glad to hear more people talking about updrafts and less about downdrafts when it comes to tornadoes. Um, it's all about the updraft. The downdrafts have done their work. They've created all that vorticity. It's swimming in the core pool. Now it's being all converged, stretched, and organized. Right there is the tornado genesis. Uh, here's another view. Again, very clearly, this is here my vorticity. It's just you know, it's streamlines in the horizontal, it's streamlines in the vertical, it just stays that way. Uh, all this red stuff is streamlines vorticity. So, you know, we, my, cl my collaborators and I came up with this idea of SVC, but there's just lots of streamlines vorticity in cold. I'm not so sure it's super important that it always has to be organized in a land or flow like this, probably is very important. However, I have to say the contribution of the streamlines vorticity from just this sort of noisier field as you've got like the river bend effect and things going on to bring everything together, is probably quite high. So, you know, there's a lot of, uh, we can trace Lagrangian parcels, we can trace all the forcing on the parcels as we go, et cetera, et cetera. One thing I've noticed as well, this is the V component of the wind. This is just the north-south component of the wind, the magnitude. So we have a jet, this is a tornado that's starting to form, you've seen that in there. But I see very strong tornadic winds away from the tornado in simulations. And the first thing you may think of, well, what's your surface boundary condition or whatever? Yes, we have issues with the surface, but we have ground relative winds, F0, EF0 easily, going on north of the tornado. This is associated with a screaming early flow that's sort of feeding the storm. I wonder, though, how important this is. And, you know, in terms of trying to, to, to uh, harden buildings and, and, and putting them into design codes, because it's kind of a really, it's an edge kind of a case. In a sense, you're all worried about this tornado which is kind of going in that direction anyway. It's probably going to destroy a lot of stuff anyway. But there are these strong winds that occur. And this is where they interface the surface, where you see the colors, but they also you can see the updraft is, is beckoning them upwards as well. Now, here's the, the reason I mentioned this and what we think about this was this is the, the re timber footage of the Andover, Kansas tornado. And I'm actually
actually hide in a tornado. I want you to focus over here on this light, the street light. Okay, here's this tornado. It's doing horrible damage. But you get this street light that goes whoop. And I think to myself, okay, does an engineer care about that? I don't know. Is that, a is that tornado damage? No, not directly, right? I'm, so things like this make me think, yeah, okay, we've got this mess to contend with, obviously, but there's also areas around the storm surrounding the tornado, the woods are quite strong, and they're actually kind of more straight line, you know? So I don't know. Okay, wrapping things up. So the things I've showed you are just sort of a, a tour of some of the things I'm working on. Recently, and this is actually very recent, um, the model I'm using, CM1, uh, it's got some updated microphysics. I'm working with Ted Manzel, who's the author of the microphysics. Uh, we just got three more microphysics working in CM1. It should be available to the public soon. Uh, I mean, now making storms are looking really kind of good. This is only 75 meter grid space, which to me is not that high. I go down to 10, 30 meters, but you're seeing some really nice looking stuff. I mean, the hail, ground level looks pretty good. This is hail and cloud. You're seeing above angle cirrus float activity is very interesting. Uh, I'm very interested in that kind of thing that's going on up there. On the ground, you can see in the cold pool. Uh, I banked the simulation off 10, 12 hours on Frontera, 12 hours to pro post process the data, 12 hours to move to the stats, and 12 hours to render. And this is pretty cool. This looks better in the dark. There's your overshooting top. I got two of them right here because it's a splitting storm. You can see the above angle series boom sort of working on it. I'm using new shading techniques and stuff to make the cloud look like an actual cloud. Because I'm interested in, hopefully we're going to get some people flying up there. I know there's some field projects that are interested in looking at the tops of these clouds. But I'm interested in understanding what is going on. Because these above able cirrus plumes, this little white snaky like thing, um, is correlated with severe weather on the ground, 75% of cases basically. The, the bed cut paper, uh, half an hour after an AECP shows up, there's either hail or tornado damage on the ground. So it could be a good outcast in the way. So I'm interested in understanding those as well. So I now have this wonderful set of better physics. I've got a lot of machine time, and I'm going to be doing rerunning a lot of simulations again. The idea is to <laughs> improve what we understand about tornadoes. But if the cloud isn't right, the tornado's probably going to be wrong. So to wrap up, and I didn't really talk about this very much, but I'll just sort of say this is my reflections as having done this for a while. Is there's very likely no path solution to tornado genesis. Um, there are mechanisms, indeed. Uh, the mechanisms I've been focusing on are definitely biased towards higher-end supercells, so I, I understand that. Um, it is a process. Trinogenesis is a process. For, for many years, I think, in the meteorological community, we've treated it as a, what's the mystery solution, what's the final trigger that gives you the tornado? And I'm saying that's probably not a good way to look at the situation. It's better to look at it as a process rather than a triggered process. A, 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 a triggered process. All tornadoes, again, this is my pedestal here, they start out as non tornado coherent non -tornado vortices with those tornadoes. That maybe is, is obvious, but maybe not. You know, the idea that a tornado descends from the sky and falls on the ground is still a pretty big idea in people's minds. It doesn't really work that way. But what I will say is the reason I put this sentence here is maybe we can track these things in their behavior before a tornado, the pre tornadic vortices. We can look at how they're merging, how they're oriented, and maybe we can get another 30 seconds of of a bleed time, right? Or at least get a better idea of what kind of tornado is going to form from that storm. It's always the case with prediction. So tornadic vortex vortices are super important. Um, the cold pool is full of vorticity, and much of it uh, gets stretched and tilted. The bare clinic, the, uh, the buoyancy term that produces lots of horizontal vorticity, I'm starting to think of that. You really need to look at the integrated effect of that rather than the instantaneous effect of it, because air has to be have a residence time to attribute a lot of horizontal vorticity due to bare clinicity. That's a lot of words to say. Cold air makes the warm air, makes it rotate, but exactly how that works, we're trying to figure out. Um, so I've been studying this 2011 El Rio storm EF5 for a long time. You see EF1 strength winds uh, associated, ground, uh, ground relative winds associated with the inflow of that storm. There's lots of abundant vertical vortices along the cold pool boundaries and within the cold pool to serve as so-called working parts of a tornado. So when we're looking at tornado genesis, um, you're looking at a series, a bunch of things going on that line up at the right time, and uh, you know, it's it's a very complicated, complicated process. How are we going to make this any better? Um, it's the same as always: faster models, faster hardware, 
better uh, utilization of that hardware, which is where I spend a lot of my time. I don't spend a lot of my time chasing, I, mean, I spend my time trying to develop faster algorithms. Uh, and it's actually working out pretty well. Uh, it's just taking a while. We need to do ensembles. You know, again, don't study one case for an average too much, and we're on the path to do that. Everything's in place. Um, and of course, when we're trying to do the prediction, we have to have better remote sensing and better data simulation, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we're in a good place right now. Um, I feel like, in terms of modeling work, we're at the point now where we can take these physical models and start to perhaps uh, interface them with human engineering models. Um, I, I'm sort of trying to do some work like that, but it's really hard. What we really want is one model with everything in it, including debris and, and the surface and all that stuff. Um, but I suspect it's not going to play out that way. I suspect there's going to be, uh, to get this problem where you have fully physical tornadoes from actual cloud models blowing up buildings and knocking stuff down, that's going to take a lot of work. Um, but I'm up for it if you guys are. So I'll pause there and say, uh, ask any questions.